Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you for attending. Uh, so today lecture is a lecture by Dr. Abdurrahman Tawfiq and we will gonna start within three minutes inshallah. So just uh, within a few minutes we will gonna start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. This is Dr. Muhammad Jamal, Assistant Professor in Anodontic at the Hamdan bin Muhammad College of Dental Medicine, MBRU. And I want to welcome everyone for our second Hamdan bin Muhammad webinar. And today we have an excellent speaker, an excellent clinician, is Dr. Abdurrahman Tawfiq. He is a consultant oral uh, surgeon and assistant uh, professor in oral uh, surgery at the Hamdan bin Muhammad College of Dental Medicine. He has sound academic and a clinical background in oral surgery and has over uh, 20 years of experience in the field of oral surgery and oral medicine. He is a graduate from King's uh, College uh, in London and he did obtain PhD from Eastman Dental Institute. He did work as an oral uh, surgeon and a consultant in UK at the NHS hospital for over 15 years. Dr. Uh, Abdurrahman has a postgraduate diploma in sedation from King's College. And he also has fast experience in pain management and dealing with actual, uh, anxious uh, patient and uh, manage a variety of oral surgery uh, cases under uh, sedation. He actively uh, contributed to the training of junior uh, dentists and oral surgery and teach at the Royal College of, uh, of Surgeon of England. I just want to welcome Dr. Uh, Abdurrahman and I just want to tell everyone that uh, be ready for very exciting uh, presentation by Dr. Abdurrahman as usual. And Dr. Abdurrahman, uh, I just want to welcome you to, uh, to this and please, I think you can start. Dr. Muhammad for the excellent introduction. Um, it's very much appreciated. It's great to be here. It's my first time to give a webinar in uh, Dubai. But uh, my topic today is going to be about surgical management of impacted uh, canines. Uh, the objective of the topic is to identify the difference between impacted and uh, ectopic canine to catalog the etiological factors that may contribute to such an impaction, analyze the guidelines for diagnosis and management of uh, impacted canines, 
a praise value being a surgical procedure involved. And also I'm going to talk about the factors that may complicate surgery and how can we manage them. So is it actually an impacted canine or ectopic canine? Uh, I notice, including myself, many people misuse the term. Uh, the word impaction means uh, uh, something blocking the path of eruption of a tooth. So the tooth is, is usually erupting into the right path, but for one reason or another, whether it's a pathology or, or dense bone or retained tooth, we're going to talk about that in detail shortly. Uh, because of any of these reasons, uh, the tooth stop erupting and either change its path or uh, just stop where it is. While ectopic canine is a fully formed canine with just abnormal path of uh, eruption. You can see here on the on the left picture uh, a canine that almost going into the floor of the orbit. And this is a CBCT uh, scan showing that the canine is fully formed, but for one reason or another, it just uh, went astray. Uh, while on the bottom right photo, with the use of this three-dimensional uh, uh, CBCT, uh, you can actually pinpoint the direction of the canine, know uh, the relationship to its uh, uh, adjacent teeth, and you can also plan the surgery or the treatment according to this, which again, we are going to talk about that in detail. So what does actually an impacted canine do? Why, why, do, why do you need to manage it? Firstly, it causes crowding, and this can affect the aesthetic uh, and or the function of, uh, of the uh, dentition. It can contribute to facial asymmetry, and this itself it can be uh, a cause of a psychological problem. Uh, impacted tooth and especially impacted canine can actually uh, cause resorption of the roots of the adjacent teeth or tooth, and this is usually the upper lateral incisor in this condition. Uh, if it is erupted in the mouth, but not in the right path, it can also, because of the crowding, can affect the periodontal condition. And Furthermore, can also cause some pathological change over the time. If you can see the top right picture, this is actually a, a friend of uh, Harmon, uh, my nurse in uh, the department, and he came to us through a referral from his dentist with this uh, horizontally looking uh, uh, canine with a very, I don't know that you can see the pointer or not, I cannot, I cannot see the pointer, but uh, I put the arrow, the yellow arrow, uh, towards the tooth, but you'd notice that there is uh, like a halo around that tooth, about two and a half centimeter in diameter, which uh, on this radiograph represents some sort of cystic change. I actually consulted with Dr. Chowdhury, who is our consultant uh, radiologist, and we did a CBCT, and it, and, uh, it, it came to be that uh, that particular uh, cyst or, or, or lesion is perforating not only the sinus, but also uh, the palatal aspect. I'm not going to talk in detail about the surgery, but uh, the bottom picture, which is the uh, hematoxyl and I've seen uh, uh, pathological uh, picture, shows threads of epithelium indicating a very thick uh, cyst lining with plenty of uh, giant cells and inflammatory cells. The diagnosis came to be inflamed dentigerous cyst, and uh, uh, this is one of the main sequelae that actually we see it from time to time in uh, impacted uh, wisdom teeth, species canine and lower third molar. Sometimes you can see amyloblastoma, but luckily with this particular gentleman, it was a cyst and he's already under treatment, and I think he is doing very well. Hopefully, once this uh, COVID crisis is over, we'll be able to review him. I cannot continue the lecture without some statistics. Uh, the canine is the most commonly impacted tooth after the, the lower third molar. It has a prevalence about 9 to 2.2% of the population. 
females are more affected than male. Uh, some people say two to one, some people say three to one. Uh, it is usually impacted palatally when compared to the labial aspect. So again, three to one percentage. And the prevalence of the lower canine is about 35.35 percent. I know not many people talk about impacted uh, uh, canine in the mandible. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. I'm also going to show you how can I manage or can we manage this uh, particular tools. I'm not going to dwell so much in the etiological factors. I'm just going to summarize them. There are either local factors, as I mentioned earlier, that actually uh, affecting the path of eruption of the tooth, or there are some systemic and genetic factors. The most common one is the tooth size in relation to the length of the dental arch. The other story is the lateral incisor. One of the theories that the lateral incisor would guide actually the canine into its position. So if the tooth is missing congenitally or because of uh, uh, loss due to trauma or any other cause, uh, the canine may not find its way or the right way to the alveolar uh, ridge. Again, anything that's blocking the canine like supernumerary tooth or retain the deciduous tooth or its root can contribute to that impaction. <clears throat> Some systemic factors uh, like uh, radiation and the crime disorders, familial, it usually happens in, in, in siblings, family members. Uh, but again, these are all theories. There's none of them is actually a real fact, but uh, some of them are more acceptable than others. Now, to manage uh, the impacted canine in, in particular and, and the orthodontic case in, in general, you need really a multidisciplinary team. There is no one can can claim that he would be the, the uh, only person managing this. Uh, usually the pilot will be an orthodontist because uh, once he sees a patient, the treatment uh, plan starts in, uh, in consultation with people like us, radiologists, pediatric and, the, and sometimes even restorative. So we'll go back to basics that doing a very thorough medical history and clinical examination is, is the trick. We cannot just diagnose and manage a case without going back to basic and knowing what is going on. Uh, most of the papers say that it is better to investigate the position of the canine at age 10 to 11 years of old. If it stays later than that, it can uh, cause a problem, but the earlier the better, so we can intercept. So in addition to the medical history and the family history, we have to do clinically palpate the canine, see if there is a bulge labially or palatally to, to show where actually is going to be. But sometimes actually there is no bulge at all if the canine is either very high up and I'm going to show you a case like that or just in the center of uh, the alveolar ridge. In addition to the clinical diagnosis, it's very important to use the radiological aids. Uh, the, paral the parallax OPG CBCT are very important, but nowadays we rely so much on the CBCT and the uh, I would like to thank Dr. Ahmed Ghanema for doing the three-dimensional uh, work for this presentation uh, because uh, in some of these cases without actually this 3D, it would be impossible to plan my surgery. Once we reach a diagnosis we will, and, and the treatment plan, the surgical intervention will happen. And the one who dictate when surgery starts again is the orthodontist because Sometimes uh, uh, the, the initial trip, it will be just very simple extraction, not even by an oral surgeon, but uh, other treatment can be very complicated. So this uh, slide show the two, the two pride is uh, not just as a bulge or the labial aspect indicate, indicating that the canine is impacted labially, but also the position of the uh, lateral incisor. You can see the lateral incisor is just uh, tilted uh, mainly labial and also distally. 
And this is because the canine is exerting a force on the root, causing some sort of a fulcrum. So it, if the root is tipped towards the palate, the crown will go labially like that. Uh, palatal bulge, uh, again, is, is, is important to feel, but if you see this um, slide, uh, you find that you can actually miss it. It is not very obvious clinically, although uh, I could manage to palpate it and other people could. So one should not rely purely on palpation and visualization. You should really use the other aids. The surgical management starts from very simple procedure, which is extraction. If the canine, like in this uh, particular uh, slide, is only obstructed by a retained deciduous tooth, the answer is very simple. Just simply take that deciduous tooth out, provided there is a space for the canine to, to erupt. If there is no space, most likely the orthodontist is going to create that space after we extract that tooth and perhaps we may need also to do some maintenance so it gives the time the canine uh, the time to erupt into place uh, ideally it should erupt within a year from the extraction into the arch if it doesn't it means that we need further uh, procedures whether uh, surgical or or just attraction from orthodontist the other procedure we use is surgical exposure. I'm actually talking about the canine that we decided to keep in the mouth because they are very important for the treatment planning. So there are some other cases I will show you later that the surgery would, would not be just exposing the canine, would be just removing the canine possibly more. So the canine, if it is located labially or palatally, it has to be exposed. There are so many techniques you can read in the literature, but in a nutshell, either open exposure or closed exposure. The open exposure, like simply like making a window, cutting part of the mucosa, possibly the underlying uh, 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 alveolar bone or palatal bone, till you expose the canine, and then put your uh, uh, bracket and then uh, the, the orthodontist will continue that the treatment afterwards. The literature, uh, I, I actually searched several ones, but there is no significant difference between the two techniques, whether you go for open uh, technique or closed technique. Uh, if you ask me which one to choose, I would say again it depends. Most of the labial one, I will, I will, I will do closed technique. I will simply raise the flap. Uh, and and uh, remove a little bit of bone, expose the canine, and and uh, this is probably the safest and the best one because we maintain the keratinized mucosa. If you do a window labially, you, it, it will be on the expense of the keratinized mucosa and it's not really uh, good for the patient. The palate is different, however, because if it is too high up in the palate, in order to expose the canine, you have to raise a huge flap. If you look at this photo, you probably will have to do a flap from the premolar on the left side to the premolar on the other side in order to reach that place. So it's probably better to just create a window, remove the palatal mucosa. Uh, if, if you are skillful enough to do it, expose the canine put some copac or whatever you want to, uh, to, to use to close the, uh, to stop the bleeding. And they actually can put the brackets on the same day or probably a week or 10 days later. This is one of the most interesting cases that I've uh, done uh, in the very beginning of my time at Mohammed bin Rashid University, which is almost three years ago. This, this young lady, uh, uh, has, as you can see, two impacted canines. The top right one is extremely high, and you can see it is surrounded by a well-defined reducent area, which eventually came to be a dentigera cyst, although the age was very young. She was about 14 and a half years old. Mm. So, it, because we also wanted to remove the lower wisdom teeth, all the, all the teeth that I put 
uh, yellow marks on the on, on them are the ones that actually were removed in the top left photograph. Uh, so I so I removed the lower uh, right and the left uh, third molars, and I exposed the upper right and left canines, and I also removed the cysts associated with the upper right canine. And uh, you can see that this was done under uh, general anesthesia. It was too complicated and uh, too really uh, difficult for a 14 years old girl. Uh, so this was a patient in theater. I raised the flap. As you can see, uh, then uh, bone is exposed. Then I started to remove the bone. You can see I'm using a round drill here. I have to admit it's not ideal. The, the ideal scenario in this case, you should use piezotome. But we don't have one, so I used the drill, but I was very careful. And you can see actually the canine was exposed. And, and then the, uh, it was etched. The bracket was put on, was put on, and then uh, was tied to the wire. Now, is, is the rule of a thumb, when you expose a canine, whether it's liberi or palatally, your exposure should be just under the wisest circumference of the canine, which is a contact area on both mesially and distally. Uh, don't ever go below that or below the cement to enamel uh, uh, junction. If you expose the root, we are going to be, we're going to run into severe trouble. So, so you really don't need to expose the whole tooth. As you can see here, is especially on the, on the lower left photo, the, you can see the contact area, the, the bracket was, was, was uh, actually bonded into the, the, uh, the uh, labial surface of the tooth. And most of the orthodontists, they like to bond that bracket as close to the incisal edge as possible to give the maximum power. Then we we'll go to the right side, which was more complicated than the left side. You can see it's much higher up. Again, I, uh, uh, I uh, removed the bone and you can see in the top right photograph that I actually created a tunnel, and this was the plan between the orthodontist and myself. And this tunnel technique is becoming extremely popular because it does actually guide the canine into place and also aid the canine to go down very quickly compared to, to the, the conventional way, I, and another way not, not doing a tunnel. Once you do that, again, you tie it to the, to the wire, you do the, the, the suturing and this this patient is a few weeks after the surgery. You can see how clear the surgery is and the, you can see the chain on the upper left and upper right are, are attached to the wire. Then several months later, the canine came down into place <clears throat> and you can see that the final photo for the full occlusion, which was really good case. This this particular one is another case that needed more than just X-ray, it needed the CBCT and the 3D construction because we were very worried about the position of the canine in relation to the root. Now, if there is a resorption of the root of the lateral, it, it it does complicate the whole procedure. Do we actually keep the lateral? Do we actually repair the, that resorption? Do we do elective root canal? So luckily with the aid of the 3D construction, we could see that one canine is, is, is actually uh, 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 labially, while the other one is, uh, is palatally. And actually partly palatal and partly labially, which is almost like maneuvering it. You need to maneuver that. Again, uh, because there was a resident with me here, uh, I was I was uh, doing the drawing with with a marker on how do we raise the flap. Uh, it's very important that when you raise a flap, is to make it big enough so you'll be able to see, and not too big to reduce the morbidity. 
as time goes, you will learn that by experience. Again, in this particular case, you can see in the bottom right picture that I created a tunnel after exposing the line. And I think this is Dr. Reem was, was assisting me in this particular case, I remember now. And then uh, you put your uh, edge, bond your bracket, uh, reflex the flap again, suture, and uh, I think the case is, is almost finished. Now, another case, this one was actually a redoing of, of a previous exposure. And this during the time of Professor Athanasius when, when he was with us. And uh, the, the lady was a little bit more mature compared to the previous uh, patients. And uh, she had an exposure and then um, unfortunately the palatal mucosa grew over it. And uh, we did a new CBCT and we found that there is a bone over that. And because she had it under local anesthesia, she was very reluctant to go for it again. And uh, we managed to get under sedation. I'll talk about the sedation later. So again, I did a window here. You can see that after the patient is sedated, you, you do the co-pack and then it was bonded later on. I just want to stop here for a second to, to tell you why this was done in two stages rather than one stage. It is always more difficult to repair I wouldn't say other people mistake, but if there's another surgery done and the patient, for instance, left uh, the country because she was traveling and longer than it should, she doesn't know that that the mucosa, species of palatal mucosa is going to grow within within few days or, or possibly a couple of weeks. So, so in this particular case, when I exposed it, it was bleeding, and it was so difficult to actually attach uh, the bracket to bond the bracket to do etching and bonding in a in a in a bleeding atmosphere is not very good. So I stopped the bleeding. I put a copac to make sure that the patient does not feel any pain. And then on a, you can see in the bottom uh, uh, left is is the initial healing, which is not bad at all. And then. Uh, we put the bracket palatally, uh, not me putting the bracket, but it's a two in the orthodontic department. Now another another case here again is palatal with window technique uh, or open technique, but it was put on the same day. The bracket was put on the same day. Now why did I do that or why you actually choose that? Again, it depends on the field and the bleeding. If there is no much bleeding, you might as well do it on the same day when the patient is anesthetized and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, either under sedation or GA. This is another one is a closed technique. I, I, we, we mentioned now exposure of canine uh, under open technique. I mentioned two cases and this one is the third one, which is uh, a closed technique. You raise a flap. The flap you can see from the premolar to almost the uh, uh, other incisor on, on the left side. And then once you raise the flap, you expose it, remove a little bit of bone. You can see the tip of the canine extremely close to the lateral incisor. And again, although this is palatal, notice, notice that we had to again, I had to get to do a tunneling procedure because imagine you expose a canal like that and this palatally and you have a very thick alveolar bone. How long this will take to 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 come into place? It will take very long. So the tunnel technique is very useful in these cases. So you can see here the tunnel is done. Ed, uh, etching the tooth with the acid edge and then bonding. And you can see the position again of the bracket very close to the uh, uh, incisal edge of the canine, then suturing. I'm going to show this case, which is about the impacted lower canine. It was quite deep, but uh, the orthodontist insisted that it's better to expose it rather than extract it, which I think he, he was very wise. So again, raise the flap, 
put a bracket and then uh, and suture it and the, I think it was very good. Now, as I mentioned, there are some factors can affect uh, the surgery. Either pathology you may, you may encounter, like uh, as I mentioned in my fourth or fifth slide about this integer cyst associated with the horizontal canine, the cooperation of the patient. If a patient is, is phobic or scared, there is no way you would be able to perform such complicated surgery. And actually, I say complicated because you saw from some of these cases, you cannot just simply do these cases under local anesthesia. I've, I've seen in, in, in some parts, people do it, but you can hear the screaming of the children from 100 meters away. I think it's very unfair and what you, you don't want to have for your child, don't do it for other people's children. Luckily, we have the conscious sedation in our department now for more than two years, which enabled us to do many things that we used to do under general anesthesia. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. So phobia and, and the compliance are very important. Other thing is the cost. A lot of people will say, oh, sorry, uh, even though you have a good treatment plan, but it, it costs them very much. It's so important to tell your patient the cost because the surgical cost is, can be very expensive. I mean, the very first case I mentioned, which was done under general anesthesia, uh, the patient was quoted the orthodontic uh, cost, but because uh, it was done in, in the city hospital under GE, took about 50 minutes. So I think the patient parents paid something over nine to 10,000 dirham, which many people are not expecting this or at least to plan for it. So it is very important to explain to them that the cost of the of the surgery is different from the cost of the uh, orthodontic treatment. Other people is the time. If, if people are going to go for surgical procedure and then continue the ortho management, many of them, they lose the interest. Unforeseen complication is, is another thing. And, uh, and uh, uh, we, 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 we dealt with one case here that has been with us for about uh, two and a half years. It just simply the canine would not go down. Eventually, you had to remove it and augment the area, and we're going to plan for an implant. So, uh, this is just one of the simple cases that that uh, didn't go as we planned. When we did the CT, there was virtually no labial plate of bone, and uh, the orthodontist was informed and and there's no point for us to to expose when we know that is not gonna work so simply the tooth was taken out in this particular case again i did with uh, dr reem uh, but i'm not gonna mention everything because she's going to say it in a different uh, uh, lecture inshallah uh, this one of the girls that uh, was seen at the ortho department and uh, accidentally and you see opposite the, the yellow arrow you see some density of the bone and uh, the initial diagnosis of, of possible some sort of dysplasia or, or bone pathology was made uh, but when you look at the x-ray the top left it looks very normal I mean, I personally, if there wasn't a, a CBCT, I would just said go ahead and expose the tooth and uh, and bond it and take it down. But uh, we were right uh, in, in the diagnosis. And again, I want to stress on something very important that this, this plan is not a decision of a single consultant. It was a group of us and we both decided what is best for the patient. So the patient came and uh, uh, I exposed the bony area, took some biopsy, and then sent it to the lab, and then it came to be fibrous dysplasia. The patient was observed, observed for a while. There was no uh, change happen in the occlusion or uh, any deformity in the bone. And I think the decision was made that we commence the treatment. And uh, if I'm not right, this is already on the way. 
Now, this is another case that uh, was referred to us by another dentist. Again, the patient went for uh, treatment uh, for crowding. And uh, he said that I, I don't know what is going on. And, and the, the resident at that time, Dr. Shama brought, it, brought the patient to us here. And uh, we did a CBCT and you can see that there is a huge uh, areas of calcification uh, causing bulging to the palate of the tooth on the right side. So believe it or not, this was done under local anesthesia. I was just saying about compliance, but this gentleman was really great. So flap was raised. Uh, you can see the top left and top right that those little teeth like material were exposed and collected and then the bottom left you can see what Dr. Shaima did that she put the number of the, I think if I'm not mistaken there are about 24 26 small little teeth and the bottom right photograph is the uh, histopathology which shows spaces which is enamel for space for enamel and area represent the dentine cementum and uh, even the dental papilla and the, the Final diagnosis was complex composite odontoma. This was the patient straight away after uh, no, after surgery. This was actually a couple of days after surgery. Now, uh, I would not let this lecture go without talking about sedation. It's one of my passionate subject. I, as, as I mentioned earlier again, without the aid of conscious sedation, many of these surgeries that they look a little bit complicated, we would not be able to do it. Either the patient would do it elsewhere and there will be no communication between the surgeon and the orthodontist. And the most of the time things go uh, as good as uh, expected. So with, with the help of this conscious sedation, uh, it, it, it saved the patient and the family a lot of uh, hustle, it decreased the cost from going to pay thousands and thousands of dirham into general anesthesia is, is only a few hundred dirham and it enabled us also to do some complicated surgeries that would not be done otherwise. And this is one of the cases that I've done with uh, Dr. Batul, my original, uh, my previous resident simply inject the patient with some midazolam, which is a sedative. I'm not going to go into detail about the technicality about that. Monitor the patient extremely well, expose uh, the canine, as in this case, remove bone, put your bracket, and then it will be fine. Now, before I end, I cannot end without talking about COVID-19. Uh, we all know that there is a pandemic crisis all over the world and the updates are very dynamic, but it is very important to protect our patients and to protect ourselves. And uh, there are so many literature now, so many, in, in you, you can actually read about them and they keep changing and, the, and many people are very innovative. The, the, they wrote down some beautiful stuff and uh, the dean and Dr. Khal and myself and Dr. Chowri, we, we wrote some sort of protocol that we might adopt at uh, our hostel and uh, we, we, we hopefully you, you too will be able to adopt the right protocol for you. The, the coronavirus pandemic claimed, I mean, for, for today, about 160,000. Sorry, this is a typing error. It's not 16 million. It's 160,000 deaths and about 2.5 million registered positive infection. In order to deal with that, we have to uh, invent a new triage system, which is what we call it telemanagement or teleassessment. Uh, we stop all the routine uh, cases. Only urgent cases that need to be managed like like uh, continuous bleeding that cannot be done or, or facial cellulitis that cannot be treated by uh, antibiotic and analgesics and, and, and a few other things but uh, 
it's important to do the right triage and uh, train whoever is going to talk to the patient about how to triage that using telephone conversation, ask the necessary question, ask about uh, the, the temperature or exposure to possible exposure to COVID-19. And the, the whole idea is to aim to have a conservative management of the triple A, which is analgesia, uh, uh, anti-inflammatory and the antibiotic. This actually was done by the British Dental Association, the Royal College of Surgeons of, uh, of Scotland. Uh, so important to train the team and, 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 and everyone know his role in this, in this crisis. It's important also to modify the practice wherever you are working, whether you own the practice or you are an associate part of the team. It's so important to modify the area. Make your reception area isolated. Make sure that there is a distance between the patient and the receptionist. Make sure that the receptionist is very well trained to ask the right question. And make sure also there is a barrier between the receptionist and the patient. Have a new system like infrared to measure the patient temperature from a distance. Make sure not to use any paperwork before the patient comes. If you did, a, uh, if you do a good telephone triage, you will be able to collect most of the information and ask the patient to send you all his details about insurance or or, or ID by email. Again, the, the clinical staff should be trained and. Uh, ideally should be tested for uh, positivity or negativity of COVID-19 infection. Why? Because you need to make sure that you also not pass the infection to a patient. We're not only scared about patient passing infection to us and others, but also us passing infection to patients. So I think in the United Kingdom now, uh, they started to test all the health uh, uh, service team, uh, even receptionists and nurses, doctors, dentists, you name it. And, uh, and uh, the ones that are tested positive will follow the right protocol, which is isolation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, if you decide to see a patient, make sure that you wear the right protective equipment. Make sure that you don't use any paperwork or any pen, consent should be verbal. And all what you need to do to say that my nurse is Mrs. So was was present and they were, uh, I consent the patient for extracting the upper right uh, first premolar and the patient agreed and so on. If you are unlucky during the process of the extraction and the break a root, uh, I wouldn't attempt to, to, to use a drill because you're going to create an aerosol and it will be bad for you and for the nurses. Yes, they say you can prepare the room with negative pressure, but is not 100% immune. So do the right thing and I'm pretty sure uh, it, will be, it will be okay. The most important thing is to stay safe. I think this is my last slide. I would like to say thank you very much for attending the lecture and listening to me. And uh, this is a QR code if you want to give us a feedback. And uh, please uh, make a note of the link as well. Thank you very much. And I'm ready for any questions. Ms. Kour, Ms. Kour, uh, uh, Abdurrahman, thank you for such excellent uh, presentation. And um, I think now the floor is uh, open for uh, questions. Um, I don't know if you can see the questions, uh, I so. Can't, uh, but let me see if I can get rid of this. And, uh, OK, I will this. just share my own. Uh, just if you can wait a second. Let me share the last slide I have. Um, um, Mm. 
So, Dr. Abdurrahman, I'm wondering if you can uh, see the, uh, the questions. No, actually, I can't. I don't know. Okay. So, well, maybe I will try to ask you some of the questions there. So, just before asking the questions, I just want to announce that if you guys want to get the credit hours, maybe if you want to scan this uh, barcode or uh, QR code, and the link is also on the screen. And also, I will copy and paste the final, uh, the final link. So, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, the first question is, uh, how we can tell if the impacted canine is placed uh, palatally or uh, puckily other than slope technique or a closer radiograph? Well, as I said, palpation uh, is the very, very first thing and the, 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 the simplest thing to do. If you can feel the pulse labially or palatally, you probably will be able to, to tell. If the patient passed the age, say, 11 or 12, and there are no sign of, 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 of uh, erupt, eruption of the canine or palpating it, X-ray using a parallax technique, uh, although is not as re reliable as it should be, but definitely CBCT will be the best way to to identify not only the position of the canine, but also its relationship to adjacent structures, whether uh, incisor or, as we said in some of these cases, the maxillary sinus or even the lateral wall of the nose. Did I answer the question? Hello? Hello? Uh, yeah, we can hear you, doctor. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll read out the next question. Uh, it says, in case of impacted canine and a lateral that already shows external root resorption, would you advise to expose the expose the ligate? the impacted canine or weight with active orthodontic traction due to resorption? It depends on the degree of the resorption. Again, we'll use, we'll use the CBCT to, de to decide how bad or extensive the resorption is. I mean, some, some people, if it is very mild degree of resorption, and I've seen some cases like that, probably will just continue the traction as normal. But I'm not an orthodontist. It's probably better for an orthodontist to answer it. But this this was the routine they do. However, if the uh, resorption is is extensive, we probably will seek an opinion of a restorative or endodontist as well to see if we can repair the root. If we think is repairable, we'll go ahead. We'll repair the root and also do the traction. If not, probably the treatment the treatment plan may change as well. Right, and the next question is, can we extract impacted canines as a GP dentist? Well, if you are skilled enough, you can. I mean, the, the, the difference between a, a specialist and a non-specialist is the extensive training uh, 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 pathways they take. If, if you are trained, very well trained, you feel confident, <laughs> you are able to deal with not only the extraction, but any possible complication. I mean, uh, one of the cases that I showed earlier, there was a perforation of the floor of the sinus and the lateral wall of the nose because of the cystic change. I mean, would you be able, whoever, were able to cope with that? Because this was a very complicated treatment and I, has, I have to, I had to use a guided tissue regeneration procedure. But if you are trained and, and happy to do that, I cannot see why not. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Abdurrahman. Um, the other question is, what severe problem can happen if you expose beyond maximum velocity of the canine? Okay, that's a very interesting question. I mean, as I mentioned, is is a cement to enamel junction is the limit. If you do that and start to expose the root, 
you first of all the tooth could be very mobile and any any force or any traction can actually make the tooth very loose also uh, bone will resolve you've already cut some bone will resolve because the area when it heals it will heal by granula granulation tissue and then it may or may not form a bone so you're going to go into into a trouble uh, really by 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 letting it heal by secondary intention so it's it's better to follow the protocol the protocol says that once you reach the widest the widest circumference or which is the distance between the contact area you stop because you have enough space to put your uh, bracket either on the incisal edge labially or palatally some people do it palatally as well uh, thank you, uh, Doctor. The other question is by Khaled. Why we can't expose the bone below CEJ in ortho extrusion? Will we get bone resorption? Well, extrusion, ex extrusion is very different from actually uh, iatrogenic uh, uh, trauma to the bone. When you when you use a drill or pisotome and, and remove bone and expose the root, you you as I mentioned in my previous question, you 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 are going into a different area of inflammation, possible dental plaque, possible uh, looseness of, of of the tooth, possible damage to the periodontal ligament. You don't want that. But if you if you use the conventional way of uh, extruding a tooth or even bodily movement of of a tooth, which sometimes we do that in case of implant. Uh, there are some cases of, of, of implant that you have virtually no bone at the upper four side. So you move the upper five mesially into the space of the upper four. And when it goes, it takes its bone with it. And then you can put your implant at the side of the upper uh, five. But with iatrogenic, it's very unpredictable. Uh, thank you, Doctor. The other question is, in some cases, can we do re-implant of canine when patient don't want orthodontics? What is yes, the success rate? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I didn't, I, I deliberately didn't mention the transplantation of, of the canine. Uh, firstly, you need a very good skill to do that. And the surgery is, is usually a extensive surgery because if you want to transplant the canine, you don't only transplant the tooth, you have to do, to do your best to take the follicle and, and, and the ligament around it. Then you have to create a space for it. But the problem is that in, in, in the case that even succeeded, most of the time it ended being ankylosed or the root resorbed at a later date. So if it is ankylosed, you will not be able to do anything with it. You cannot even move it. So I think the final decision would depend on how far the canine is, what sort of orthodontic plan you, you, you are going to use. And as I mentioned in, in, in my lecture, you need a, a multidisciplinary team for that. There is no point to go and do heroic surgery when you know it's not going to benefit the patient. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, the other question, I don't know if you did uh, if you did answer this before. It's by Dr. Mama Marlis. In a case of, of impacted canine and a lateral that already shows external resorption, would you advise to expose and ligate impacted canine or to wait with the active orthodontic? Yeah, this is exactly uh, the question is you asked. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I, I answer that, but again, okay. I, I, sure. I remember yeah, sure. it depends on the, uh, 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 how yes. extensive the resorption is. Yeah. Yeah. So the second question is, in which age uh, would you not go for uh, surgery? You can go for surgery really at, at, at any age, but if it is very young, I wouldn't go for surgery unless, unless there is a need for it. But uh, the, the problem is that the more you leave it, the, the, the more complicated it becomes. And uh, usually uh, exposing, exposing canine in adults is, is, is sometimes more difficult. 
but there is no definite age as long as there is an indication for the surgery and the patient uh, is healthy. There is no medical problem that uh, uh, would stop us from doing his surgery. We can do it. Some people do ortho at age 50 and 60 as well, including surgery as well. Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman? No. Yeah, so I will just repeat the question. The other question says, uh, Hi, Dr. Uh, Hamid is here. You mentioned something about a tunnel for some of the exposures. Can you explain what that is and why we create it? Thanks. Okay. The tunneling technique is, is documented. It's a very well-known technique now. It's been used for a while. The whole idea is, is creating like a gutter, like a path, like a, a groove to guide the canine where it's supposed to be. If the canine is too close to the lateral incisor or too far palatally, and as I mentioned that the, the bone is too thick, it will take ages for the canine to come into place. Also, if it is very close to the lateral, you need a way to guide it. So what you need to do is when you expose the canine and you know exactly where the position is going to be, you create like a, a groove with your drill or the piezo tone. And the, through that groove, the traction by the orthodontist is, is going to happen. As simple as that. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the other question is, is there any classification I can apply at age 10 to know canine will be impacted? Well, there are so many classification, class 1, class 2, class 3, and uh, uh, it, it depends on the, on the height, it depends on the position. Uh, it, I, I don't know how, how useful this is going to be if, if you 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 are not going to do the surgery and the treatment yourself but if if you already plan to do orthodontic treatment with surgical intervention uh, the most reliable way of deciding the position of the tooth and and the, and the, the guidance for the surgery is cbct cbct even if it is class one or or, or class two it, it will give you an indication, yes, it is high up, it is in the palate, it is below the cement to enamel junction, but this is not enough. You really need to know precise where the canine is, how close to the roots of the, of the adjacent teeth, and you will not be able to do that without CBCT. Thank you, Doctor. The other question is from our friend uh, Jeffrey Sharp. How can we predict how long it might take from exposure of an impacted canine until the tooth fully erupts? And then he just uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. I, I think is 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 not an easy question to answer because it does vary on so many things. Firstly, how far is the canine from the uh, alveolar ridge? If the canine is too far up, it will take differently long. Also the technique, if you are doing a tunneling technique, it means that the resistance against movement is much less than when you have full bone. Uh, it will take definitely uh, longer. Um, also if the canine is enclosed or not, or if it is something obliterating it or not. We, we, we had a case that we've been doing it for a while, and the right side was absolutely fine. The rest of the side, after two, I think, years and, and a quarter, uh, Professor Ghanem and myself decided that it's better to take that canine out, augment the area, and put a dental implant. So it's, it's very difficult to predict. Again, uh, it, depend, it depends also on the bone quality as well. Thank you, Doctor. And just a reminder to everyone that uh, I think you can see uh, the QR code 
and also you can see down the link for the evaluation form after you fill the evaluation form then you can go and get the credit hours and please uh, this uh, website it will be active only for a few hours after the presentation so if you want to get the credit hour please go and fill the evaluation form and uh, please allow almost like 24 hour to 72 hour to uh, to get the certificate with the credit hour. Dr. Abdurrahman, another, another question. What would you do if it was a mandibular impacted canine? Yeah, I, I, I showed the case. The, the protocol is exactly the same. Uh, most of the mandibular canines are usually labially. Uh, again, you expose, put a bond, and, and, uh, and do traction. There was a, a full case that I showed in my in my slides uh, there. But if the mandibular canine is too far and some cases are too far, you have to uh, you have two way to manage that. Uh, either extract it if there is an orthodontic uh, plan and they need to move the teeth and, uh, and take the space or if there is no ortho plan and there is no pathology, I would just leave it. I wouldn't do anything. Mind you, the, the mandible is slightly different because you have the mental nerve is, 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 is not too far. Uh, also, the canine could be a little bit tilted towards the lingual aspect, so, so it can cause bleeding when you actually remove it. However, like, like as I said earlier, it needs to be planned properly and a decision should be made whether do we need to uh, expose or do we need to extract or just to leave without doing anything. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I think we are getting a lot of questions and we just have uh, um, a few minutes to stay. But anyway, I will keep continue asking the question. How to predict the chance of normal path of eruption? Does examining the midline axis uh, beyond or overlapping give indications? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I didn't understand the question very well. I mean, uh, I mean, there is a chronological age for eruption. If the tooth is not erupted for one of the reasons that I mentioned earlier in the lecture, whether a local factor or systemic factor, we have to manage every reason, reason individually. But predicting it is, I don't know how to predict it. Uh, the other question is, what's the treatment done for fibrous dysplasia? That's a good question. Yeah, uh, the fibrous dysplasia are several types. The one we saw is monostotic type. Is it, it 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 is is a bit of disturbance in the maturation of bone. Luckily, the monostotic type that happened in 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 the jaw. Uh, it, it is actually self-healing. It, it stops. It doesn't. It doesn't go any further after uh, puberty, or, or some people say up to age 21. Now, if there is no deformity, I wouldn't do anything. I would just uh, leave it and consider it just uh, dent the bone. But if there is deformity, we'll deal with that either by shaving the bone, alveoloplasty, or whatever. But uh, or some some orthognathic surgery, but uh, usually the the fibrous dysplasia that occur in the jaw is a monostatic type, and it's self-limiting. And my advice that if it's not causing any deformity, or the deformity means just uh, maybe intraoral with a little bit of protuberance, uh, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't really do anything. But if if it's going to cause a problem, yes, we can deal with it surgically. In that case, which I mentioned today, uh, it's Dr. Reem's case, uh, we observed the patient for a year and it did look fine. There is no change in the occlusion. There is no change in the thickness of the bone, nothing whatsoever. And uh, I think they commenced the treatment and uh, in my opinion is doing very well. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, and another question: Can we place the ortho braces as GBs after the surgery, or all this procedure done by combination of oral surgeon and orthodontist? Well, uh, again, I'll go back to my previous answer. If you are if you are 
properly trained and know what you are doing. I cannot see why not. I mean, in, in, in the UK, a lot of general dental practitioners, they do Botox, for instance, and filler, and they, and they do bulk the masseters, and because they are properly trained. My, my son is a pharmacist and he does Botox as well. So it depends on 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 your training and 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 how long you've been doing you've been doing that. So if you are well trained and feel confident and know what you are doing, you probably wouldn't even ask that question. Uh, but if you are not hundred percent sure, there is no point. At the end of the day, you really need to to provide the best care for your patient, and the best care is to give him the best treatment. If you are not trained enough to give the best treatment, refer him to a specialist, whether uh, it depends on what specialty, and the patient will be very grateful and will appreciate that and you'll never lose a patient. But uh, but if, if you just experiment with a patient, I don't think it is right. Sure. Uh, the other question, how do you control bleeding after exposure prior to placing a bracket? There are several ways. Firstly, it depends on the surgery itself. Usually, the labial one, the bleeding is not that difficult. You you just wash the area, put a little bit of pressure, inject the area with with some uh, local anesthetic with adrenaline. It will do some constriction and it will be absolutely fine. Uh, isolation, you need to isolate as well. Uh, the palatal one, if it is a window technique, it's slightly more difficult because window is simply you are, you are actually making like a, a circle over the crown of the canine, then removing the bone underneath, and uh, the bleeding usually is, is more than the labial one. In this particular case, you, you cannot uh, really do it without doing something physically on, 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 on the tools. Either use bone wax, which is very, very good way of, of, of controlling bleeding. You can use the perio pack or the co-pack, which I, um, I'm, I think I like that very much because uh, it, it protects the patient from infection. It also reduces the post-operative pain and it, it imposes a pressure on the area. And after two or three days, if it didn't fall and so on, it's easy to just remove it with your excavator or Mitchell trimmer. And you can actually have a very clean field. You can put your brackets there. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the other question, what are the uh, AAA conservative uh, management again, please? Yeah, analgesia, anti-inflammatory, antibiotic. So you, you phone the patient and the patient just in pain, I'll give him some analgesia, uh, usually paracetamol or, or whatever. Uh, if, if there's a little bit of swelling, I'll give him some anti-inflammatory as well. But if there is a swelling, temperature and sign of, of all this cardinal sign of infection, I would advise the patient to take some antibiotic. Yeah, so analgesia, anti-inflammatory, and antibiotic and some people also add for one lately is assurance as well yeah, assuring the patient is very important especially in this time so the other question actually i have a case of my sister 16 years old with impacted upper canine is there any complication related to postponing due to the current situation uh, well, she needs to be assessed first of all by the orthodontist and will do the right X-ray. I'm pretty sure a couple of months or a few months, so hopefully this crisis will be over within a few months. And they are most welcome to refer your sister to our uh, institute. And I'm pretty sure uh, Professor Venim and his team will be able to see to see her. And if need surgery, either me or Professor Zaid will manage that. Yeah. Is there a paper which compare between exposure with tunnel uh, versus without a tunnel? Yes, there is actually. I was reading one, but I forgot it. So I'm I'm happy to 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 forward it later. But yeah, there is there is one. Yes. Okay. I think it's, it's by Fleming. I think it's by Fleming. Is 2019. If you if you search for Fleming, it it will be it will be 
this one is a very beautiful uh, uh, review. Uh, I think it was, was published 2019. But if not, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to to send it somewhere on the website. Yeah. Or you can email me, whoever, whoever can email me and I'll, send, I'll, I'll answer back to him or her. Sure. What's the difference between open and closed exposure? Yes, the, the, the closed exposure is you reflect the mucoperiosteal flap and, uh, and then uh, you remove your bone, expose the tooth, and then put the flap back again after you put the, the bracket. You don't actually cut the mucosa at all, but open is either you cut part of the mucosa and I wouldn't advise it if it is buccally or, or you modify it. Uh, uh, like epically reposition flap or something like that, which is called the open technique. So the closed technique is the one that actually you reflect the mucosa, put it back, put the chain, tie the chain into the wire, or some people even uh, 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 bond it to the ad adjacent tooth. And, and this is called the closed technique. The open technique, either when you make a window, like the one I saw, I showed in the palette, which I think I put two or three cases like that, or if it is labially, is uh, when you actually do epical position flap, yeah. I wouldn't cut um, the mucosa labially at, at any extent. I wouldn't do that. Some people do, but it's not advisable. The keratinized mucosa is very important for the patient. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. In which case would uh, would the soft tissue grow over the exposed canine, and how do we avoid it? Again, this is a good question. Uh, I mean, it will grow if you leave it very long without uh, without actually putting the brackets and and start your traction. Uh, once you do the exposure, the oral mucosa heals very quickly. I mean. Uh, a, a cut in the tongue will heal within three days. Uh, again, again in the in the palate as well. So it it will heal very quickly. It will granulate, and within two weeks, it it will cover the whole palate. So ideally, you put your brackets on the day of the surgery, or maybe a few days after the the removal of the copac. If you leave it for very long time, it will grow, and and. Uh, there's no point to do the surgery unless you are 100% sure that the patient will be coming for follow up and either have the bracket uh, uh, put or or the traction start the orthodontic treatment start. But to put it and leave it, it is not advisable. Uh, question from May: In case of midline shift and canine impaction, which one should be treated first, or can they be? both be treated in the same time? Well, uh, I don't know that I'm the one who qualified to answer that or not. If Professor Ahmed or uh, Dr. Lepterius is here, I'm, I'm happy to hear. Well, I, I don't know, Mike. I mean, to be honest with you. Uh, uh, plan the case and, and, and according to your treatment plan, you, you, you decide whether to do the movement of the teeth first or or the surgery uh, first. There are so many cases I have done the planning with uh, with the ortho team, and once we see the patient and uh, his or her parents, we say, for instance, it will take about six to eight months to move the teeth, create the space, and then we'll start the surgery at that time. Some other cases we just started instantly. It depends on each on each patient. Yeah. Which is better to extract? Uh, Palately impacted canine or labially impacted canine for better prognosis from Sima uh, Bahandri? To extract, I mean, if the tooth is, if the tooth need to, to be extracted, just extract it. it, it I, I mean, prognosis in what way? Most canines, uh, whether it is palately impacted or labially impacted, if it is not going to cause any problem and if you are not going to do any treatment, you probably leave it. But if there is an also uh, a, a treatment plan that indicates that the canine should be extracted in another way, it's too difficult to 
I mean, some 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 of the cases, as as you as you saw here, I mean, we're very lucky that that canine on the middle of the palate, we're very very lucky to move it in in indeed. Uh, uh, but if it is too far and too high, it's, it's no point to just expose the patient to surgery when you don't know whether we'll be able to bring it back into place or not. So if there is indication for extraction, regardless this palatally or, or, or labially, you take it. But, but it, is, it is not one or another. If the tooth is located and you need to have a labial approach, Yes, you have to. You, you have to. Your surgery has to be through the labial side. But if it is palatally, it will have to be through the palatal aspect. So it depends on the position of the tooth. I hope I answered that. Uh, thank you, Doctor. We have a few questions which are the same. What are the most common complication uh, of failure post surgery, or maybe during the surgery and post surgery? Well. The most common complication uh, after surgery is infection, like any wound. Uh, if and 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 if you don't follow a, a, a strict surgical protocol, you are likely to get infection. Uh, but there are so many other complications during the surgery. For instance, if you are not careful, you can cause iatrogenic uh, problem. You can either uh, uh, injure the enamel of the canine itself when you are moving bone or adjacent structure. Uh, you, you, you can run into some sort of structure like and get, get bleeding or not able to stop it. You may remove too many, uh, too, too, too much bone and, and then become very loose. And I've seen actually one uh, case like that in, in the UK about 15 years ago, someone was supposed to expose the canine and they, and they just came out. Uh, so, the bone removal was too much. Uh, swelling, bruising, all these are, are complications of any surgery, not, not just specific to the canine. But the one we mentioned earlier is, is uh, most, in my opinion, troublesome, is that if you do the exposure and then leave it for a while and it grows again, you're going to expose the patient to another surgery and it's very unfair. Uh, can laser electrics be used to expose labial impacted canine which are palpable? Labially? Yes. Well, uh, I think it's going to be very difficult because you are going to end the removing part of the keratinized mucosa, which is very important for the patient function. Uh, if you're going to use the laser just to, 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 to to mark your flap in order to reduce the bleeding, that's fine. You, you do you do your flap like that, and then you will have to continue the conventional way using a periosteal elevator and then osteotome to and the uh, 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 pisotome in order to remove the bone. And it will be the normal way, but to create a window and, and cut the uh, keratinized mucosa is not advisable. Laser is 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 good if you want to reduce the bleeding, but uh, not 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 to cut the gingiva for canine. No. Palatally, yes, it's possible. If if you if you ask me palatally, I would I'll probably if I have it, I will definitely use it. Uh, in, again, in the UK, we used to 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 use CO2 laser. Uh, is 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 very good in cutting. Virtually no bleeding whatsoever. Someone was been talking about bleeding before. And, and this is a very good way of doing it. Uh, and it, you have a very clean uh, exposure. Uh, but again, you will have to still cover the, the exposed area with some sort of, of protectors like co-pack or, or, or bone wax or something like that. Uh, if the patient doesn't want to align or extract impacted canine, that is possible. I didn't get the question. Uh, on my <coughs> so I think the question, I would just say it exactly as it is. If the patient doesn't want to yeah, go in. Yeah, again. if the patient doesn't want to align or extract impacted canine, leaving yeah. that canine is possible? Yes, it's possible, provided number one, 
uh, is not associated with, with any pathology. We know that, uh, uh, as I showed earlier, that you can get some dentigerous cyst with uh, with the impacted, especially upper canine. Also, very rarely amyloblastoma, but it happened. Uh, if the canine is in ectopic position, it can impose pressure on adjacent structure. Uh, I've seen one in the nose, which I put the radiograph earlier. Uh, it can also cause resorption of the roots, uh, tilting of the other teeth. If it's not causing all this, uh, uh, problems, I would leave it. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it if the patient is happy. Yeah. I think there are a few questions which are the same. Like in case of impact, and I don't know if you did answer that, like in case of impacted canine root was closed or even penetrate the floor of the maxillary uh, sinus, what are the treatment option and is there any kind of a complication? Yes, definitely there is. I mean, if again, you you will have to plan it beforehand. Any any surgery, like anything, has to be planned beforehand. If we do our homework right and have the CBCT and and the uh, uh, you have a good uh, radiologist who who would be able to work with you and tell you exactly the measurements, how far the canine is from the floor of the sinus, or if there is any uh, penetration of the floor of the sinus, that penetration is it surrounded by bone, so it will be like a or like a socket, or or is not surrounded by bone. If you know all these facts in advance, you'll be able to plan for it. So, for instance, if you take the canine out. Uh, and 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 th there is uh, uh, invagination in the floor of the sinus, but all that is pure bone. I wouldn't worry about any complication whatsoever, provided you you know what you are doing. You didn't actually do the the iatrogenic uh, 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 injury yourself. But if you know that the chance of perforating the floor of the sinus. It's high, or there is no bone. When you take the canine out, there will be to be exposed. Yes, you have to repair that, and the repairing that can can start from simple uh, guided tissue regeneration, putting some uh, resorbable or or non-resorbable membrane. Uh, you can put PDF as well, like the ones they use for infraorbital fracture. But uh, but again, if if you plan this properly, you will know exactly what to do just in case it happens. And this, uh, going back to the question of more than one person, a person asked, can a GP do this and can a PG do that? The problem is not doing it. The problem is what to do if you run into complications. Any Anyone can probably drive a car, but if you don't know how to drive properly, you can just, God knows what will happen. So this is exactly the same. You, you can attempt, but but if you don't know what to do, if if you run into trouble or complications, uh, I wouldn't do it. I'll just send it to the people who can do that. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, doctor, if the canine is clinically missing after X-ray found the canine tip is distally located toward sinus, would you recommend to do surgery to remove it or keep it in a place? If it's not causing any problem, I'll just leave it in place. But if there are any pathological, uh, 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 any pathology associated with that canine, definitely uh, I will interfere. But uh, if usually there shouldn't be a problem, we leave it in the place. But, I mean, like like even some upper wisdom teeth, this is very close to the infraorbital rim. I wouldn't attempt to remove them unless they are causing infection or or, or associated with pathology. So if there is uh, no pathology, I'd leave it. Sure, I think uh, we still are getting um, a question. I just want to advise everyone that we only have three minutes for more questions, and unfortunately, we won't be able to answer all the questions. But that indicate that, mashallah, as usual, Dr. Abdurrahman lecture is always interesting, and it uh, trigger everyone to ask more and more Thank questions. Uh, what are the factors that consider the effect of the decision of type of the processes? Say it again. Exactly as it is written, what are the factors that consider the effect of the decision of type of prosthesis? I think uh, I think the, the question is 
what are the factors that it will affect your decision of the final processes or the type of the processes? We we don't do processes for the for the canine. I mean, uh, the canine is either exposed or, of, or, or removed because of pathology or because of orthodontic treatment. So whoever decides the, the type of, of, of orthodontic appliance is the orthodontist is not is not myself. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I removed the canine palatally and uh, I had to do uh, an appliance, uh, which which some, something like a suck down plate in order to keep the palatal mucosa in in place. But I don't think the the the, the person who asked that question means this. OK, uh, so of course people are asking for your email. Um, yeah, uh, to them. Happy. Yes. Uh, then. Um, I think this has been already asked before. We just took the impaction canine in theoretical part and we don't get to train of it in the university. So is it safe to do such cases or relying on our own information? Of course not. Uh, definitely not. I wouldn't. I mean, it's, it's like going and watch YouTube and, and start to do heart surgery or brains. I wouldn't do that. No, 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 no. I mean, if you are not properly trained, don't do it. I mean, there are so many videos and 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 um, some diagrams they look easier than actually is if this if these videos and diagrams replace the real training nobody would uh, would would go for for postgraduate training if you are interested uh, definitely you have to 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 go to into a course or, or some sort of uh, proper training to teach you at least some of the basic oral surgery skills because you really need to it's, it's not just being taking out a, a canine you need, you need to know how to do an incision on it, on what basis you make your incision big or small i do i keep the, the uh, incisive capilla or not do i keep the attached mucosa or not how how much bone do i need to remove there are so many decisions you will never be able to to make them by reading a book or, or watching uh, a YouTube video. Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, uh, thank you for uh, this excellent uh, presentation. And I just want to advise my colleagues who are attending. Thank you for attending and hopefully you did enjoy it. Uh, on the screen, I think you can see this barcode in which you can scan to get into the evaluation. And here you can see the link for the evaluation form in which you can uh, use to fill and to in order to get the credit hours. And please allow 24 hours to 72 hours to get the credit hours. Uh, I would just, uh, uh, I don't know, Dr. Abdurrahman, if it's okay if I can share your email. Yes, please do that. So yeah. now I'm just sharing Dr. Abdurrahman email. So I know that we have a lot more questions. So if you have any question, please uh, just send an email to Dr. Abdurrahman and I will just post the link of the uh, I will just post the link of the presentation again. Uh, I mean for the evaluation. I will just post it again on the um, and so this is the link for the evaluation. So if you can uh, use that link and uh, to get into the evaluation page and uh, and then you can fill the form and get the credit hours. Um, thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman. Thank you thank to my uh, colleagues and everyone who did attend. Uh, we will announce our uh, coming uh, webinar soon, inshallah. I think we have a few uh, coming in the month of May and Ramadan as well. So inshallah, we will continue with that. And, uh, and Ramadan Kareem in advance. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you.